So I guess a good place to start would be a sort of high level view, value stream management. What is it? And I guess, why does it matter, particularly maybe at the current time? So I'm going to actually get to start by saying it, what it's not. So I think there's some general confusion in the marketplace. Uh, because it is an emerging market, let's establish that as well. It's quite new. We only really saw the analysts picking it up in 2020 as a new concept that Forrester originally coined in 2017. And I'll come back to their definition in a minute. But the thing that it's not is value stream mapping. Value stream management is quite different. So value stream mapping, and they're both out of the lean canon. So TPS, Toyota production system from the 1950s that originated manufacturing. We've worked across the enterprise and we're now really learning how to leverage it in technology teams. But value stream mapping is um, an exercise in visual collaboration that involves quite heavy human element. It's quite narrative driven. It's qualitative. Whereas value stream management really is about the ongoing management of value streams from a process perspective and increasingly from a platforms and a technology perspective. So it's, it's much more continuous, it's much more data driven, um, it, it's much more qualitative. So I mentioned Forrester, so I'll give you their definition. Um, they say that value stream management is a combination of people process and technology that maps, optimizes, visualizes, measures, and governs, does quite a few things there, <laughs> business value flow through heterogeneous software delivery pipelines. So there's the technology and the platform coming in, and it's concerned with idea through development and into production. And this leads me into answering the second part of your question, which is why it, it's important now. So my background is deeply in DevOps since the start of it sort of 10 or 11 years ago. And I've been a DevOps practitioner as a consultant to quite a few different clients, mainly in finance and banking industries through the UK, Europe, and the Middle East. And DevOps started as an extension of Agile. We started with um, a system administration, basically Agile system administration and Agile infrastructure. So it was trying to fix some problems between the development and the IT operations departments, which were the classic two main silos we had in technology teams. And then it became something much broader and we started to think about the end-to-end -end value stream. So for quite a long while, I was talking to customers about optimizing the flow from idea to value realization and actually extending the CI CD pipeline much further and, and getting this idea of an end-to-end -end DevOps tool chain. And there were a couple of frustrations I had as a practitioner. One was um, the level of capability for organizations to architect and visualize their tool chains that way and be able to connect the dots between them to actually get um, solid metrics out. And that leads me to the other frustration, which was our seeming inability to establish a good set of standard metrics for organizations to use and teams to use that really helped continuous improvement. And then the third part of it was as a value stream mapping practitioner was the inability of organizations to revisit what they were doing with value stream mapping. So we would um, have these very expensive exercises from a consulting fee point of view and also from the cost of getting the humans in the room or in the space for the extended period of time that it takes to do that work. Um, we'd have loads of amazing kind of light bulb moments. We'd come up with these ambitious plans um, and then seemingly quite often we just revert to business as usual and we wouldn't execute um, on what we were planning to do originally. So when I first heard about value stream management, for me, it was an epiphany because it solved a lot of these problems. It connects the tool chain end to end. It gives us some really amazing metrics around things like cycle time and flow efficiency. And it gives us the ability to automate the value stream map, which means that we can continually inspect and adapt according to what we're seeing. So we don't have that really heavy overhead that we were seeing with the traditional value stream mapping approach. Okay, so in terms of um, founding the value stream management consortium, you mentioned a couple of times sort of metrics, et cetera. Is it, is it founded the main intention to sort of standardize definitions and approaches because obviously there are different vendors in it to at least have some sort of common denominator ideas or what's the thinking behind forming the consortium i think the word standardization um i don't feel completely comfortable with so let's just kind of maybe go back to the start and, and talk about what the intention is so um first of all the value stream management consortium is a not-for-profit trade association um that means it's open to all 
um, it's tax exempt. And it means that what we're really trying to do is create a community. So the reason we instantiated it is we feel that this as an emerging market needs to be nurtured and cultivated. And we recognize that there was um, quite a large existing community out there and a very rapidly growing community of people that were asking very similar questions and felt the same way we did, um, which is passionately that value stream management is um, a key to achieving some of the economic goals which are promised globally in terms of coming out of this um, technology revolution cycle that we're in, if you look at Carlotta Perez's work, into the next golden age. And we feel that value stream management has the potential really to unlock um, a lot of the promises and benefits that we've been seeing, Agile and DevOps and Lean and ITSM and all these different frameworks we've been having promising and really, really bringing <clears throat> those benefits to bear. So part of what we are trying to do is work with the community to um, understand patterns. I think I'd rather use the word patterns than standards. So patterns that are working in organizations and ways to experiment with things to make the kind of improvements that we're hoping to do in terms of accelerating value into the customer's hands. Okay, and in terms of the membership uptake, I mean, A, is it available to companies and individuals? Uh, and depending on that anyway, can you explain sort of who's joined in so far and what sort of activities the members are, you know, expected or encouraged to get involved with? Absolutely. So, um, First of all, I'm going to explain how we've set up the consortium. So being Agile and DevOps practitioners, we have taken an Agile approach to this. So what we launched on March the 8th was effectively our MVP, our minimum viable product. Um, so we are now in our second increment. So in our minimum viable product, um, what we did was we brought on five founder members, which are actually all vendor enterprises rather than end user enterprises. Um, we had intentions of having end user enterprises involved with the MVP, but the, um, the legwork of getting on supplier lists and making it happen um, was not proving timely enough for our planning. So we had some other ideas about bringing specific customers on board, and that's something we're still doing. Um, but the five founding members are uh, Tasktop, Plutora, ServiceNow, HCL Software and Digital.ai. So, um, all firmly recognised leaders in this space in places like the Forest Wave, so in some of the, the analyst research we're seeing. Um, what Part of what we did to um, satisfy our requirement to not be vendor driven, and it's not the intention to have the consortium to be vendor driven, it's just to get it started. That's what we really need to do. But we also have a handful of board advisors and that's expected to grow. So we have um, Alistair Watkins, we have Brian Finster, and we have Steve Pereira, um, who all either work for enterprises or are independent consultants. So give us um, a slightly different view. And we certainly hope to see all of those categories expand and, and hope to see our board advisory expand as well. So membership is open to all now. We, in the second increment, a big part of it is um, getting these new members onboarded. And with the launch, we've had um, a really quite overwhelming amount of interest, actually, which has been um, really helpful because you sometimes wonder um, whether you're a lone voice in the darkness. And it turns out that we're not. A lot of people are really interested in this. So that's great. Um, we have three membership levels, which um, we explain on the website at the moment, but we are going to be shortly um, broadcasting or making available more information about what those levels are. Um, but we have the influencer level, which is for individuals. Um, they're going to be able to pay their fees on a subscription basis monthly or an annual subscription basis. Then we have two levels which are intended for organisations and it doesn't specify whether they are a vendor consultancy or end user organisation, but the levels are um, partner and leader and basically partner is for organisations who want to benefit from everything that the community is doing, um, but don't necessarily want to drive the market. The leader position is for somebody who wants much more influence over the, the market direction. Um, being a not-for-profit trade association, uh, our, the way that we make money is through our membership fee. So all membership levels will be chargeable. And then the benefits that members will receive will depend on their levels of membership. But they will be things like access to or deep access to research. I'll come back to research in a second. Um, access to training and certifications. 
um, access to potentially open source projects that we might do in the future as well, and access to resources, learning resources and webinars and things like that that we will do. Obviously, we'll want to do some things publicly in order to gain more membership, because that's the only way we can keep investing in our own research and development. When we launched on March the 8th, we also launched our first research project, which is the State of Valley Stream Management Report. So that survey is open now. It'll probably be open till early April, and we're hoping to release the first inaugural State of Valley Stream Management Report um, in early May. And the kind of things we're trying to answer there is, I broadly talk about two categories, flow and realisation. So we're trying to understand how organisations measure flow and what they do in order to accelerate flow. And we're trying to understand how they estimate what value outcomes they're going to receive and how they actually understand whether they've realised those estimated value outcomes once they've done their work. So yeah, that research is live. It's going to be our flagship research. Um, the next stage for us is probably going to be around the training certification um, and very closely related to that will be um, some work around role descriptions and organisational design as well. Um, and then the other piece of what's happening in terms of what members can get involved with, the way that the consortium works is we have the board directors, which is one cell, if you like, we have a holocratic approach to our organisational design. Then we have cohorts. So we have an outreach cohort and the outreach cohort are responsible for marketing and membership. Um, we also have a research cohort who are responsible for research and we're just putting together a learning cohort as well at the moment um, who will be driving the training and certification. And we'll keep building out cohorts as we get new initiatives. Um, and the reason I mentioned the cohorts is this is part of the benefit of being a member is you can have representation uh, on those cohorts. Okay, so in term, you covered a lot of ground in terms of the the activities now in terms of objectives i mean if we had a conversation in 12 18 months time what would you maybe hope to have achieved you know during that time in terms of uh, projects or just general raising of visibility um number one is increase the membership uh number number two is get the research out they're probably equal priority actually um, increasing the membership allows us to invest in other things. So the, the next thing would be get training and certification out there. And then our metrics will be around getting numbers of people trained. Um, and that will be a benefit of membership is access to the training and the certification. Um, I mentioned open source projects. They're a little way away. We might look at doing some open source projects like making some online value stream mapping tooling available, for example. Um, but those are a little bit out of the, the next increment at the moment. So. Our success metrics are essentially around membership numbers and therefore income, which is therefore related to the investment that we make, which then relates to the um, outcomes we have in terms of resources and availability. Ultimately, the metrics that we'll be using are those that we learn from our members themselves. So how they are using value stream management to improve their own organization performance. Um, and that's really where we'd want to be by the end of the year is having actual case stories about how people are using these technologies and platforms and processes to improve their organizational performance. And in terms of a roadmap, I mean, I, we, we've talked about those objectives, but will you create a roadmap when you've sort of got a, the members on board enough and you, you know, you have discussions and then come up with a roadmap? Or do you already have that sort of mapped out over a longer period? Or is, they, is that something you will create with the members at some stage? We will be continually taking an agile approach. Um, so we will have the long term vision and goal in mind always. And we will have an element of portfolio. So talking about the things like the marketing and the membership and the learning um, and the research um, and all that kind of makes a high level roadmap. But we will continue to work in an experimental manner where we are pivoting and taking feedback from our membership community about what they want to see and continually experimenting um, with what we deliver and building and enhancing the products that we um, evolve over time. Okay, and if we could just um, maybe before finish, look at um, value stream management in a sort of broader context. Uh, I, I sort of bumped into it when I was talking to a load of companies about AI ops, uh, and there are other things you mentioned, I think IT, SM. Um, how do you see value stream management evolving over time? I know it's a, maybe a slightly open-ended question, but there are a lot of these sort of technologies around AI, end-to-end -end management ideas. Do you see them all coming together at some stage in some kind of super structure that has end-to-end -end management at absolutely every single IT asset? Or do you think there'll always be a, a, a role for more 
sort of broken down approach to, to managing the, the IT stack? It's a very astute question. I'm actually going to turn my answer around from your question. I'm going to address ITSM first and then AIOps. So um, from an ITSM perspective, it's already very much part of value stream management. So a typical um, stack that you might think of that you might want to start um, leveraging if you were to implement the value stream management platform would be something like backlog CI and service desk. So just to name some tools and there could be any tools but something like Jira Jenkins and ServiceNow for example and you'll have noticed that um, ServiceNow who have traditionally been thought of as an ITSM service desk partner are one of our founder members and they've been firmly and squarely in 2020 put into the VSM space by the analysts as well. So ITSM, um, absolutely part of it. And remember, it's that end-to-end -end process. It is from idea through to value realization. That includes um, deploy and release, and it includes operate and monitor um, and manage. So it's, it's already part of it. The AI ops question is a little bit different. And I should point out that I am an independent consultant. So as well as um, my role as chair of Value Stream Management Consortium, I have some other roles, one of which is strategic advisor to Moogsoft who are a big AI ops vendor. So I'm kind of close to this space and it really particularly interests me because whilst a lot of the conversations we have about value stream management right now are concerned primarily with the flow. Remember I talked about flow and realization. Most people are focused on flow. I actually think realization gets very, very interesting once we understand the flow. So it helps us understand whether the investment in the work that we've just done is, is giving what we thought it would. So it's, it's a business decision-making process effectively and I think AI ops has huge potential in this space now with AI ops we tend to box it into instant management we tend to think of it as something that helps us reduce MTTR and discover root cause and reduce noise and helps make sense for our monitoring systems but actually what it's looking at is performance and that's so closely related to customer experience that we can actually extrapolate that to give us some data and insights into value realization so even something like session length or bounce rate can tell us quite a lot about what the impact of the new thing that we just released to our users has had and whether it's um, whether it's been useful and we should be using those sort of metrics in our estimates of what that value is going to create in order for us to understand um, whether we achieved what we set out to do and therefore give us some um, guidance on what we should be doing next. Okay, and maybe finally, finally, I mean, you, you said Bob, clearly that value stream management is in its sort of infancy. Mm -hmm. So for folks and users that are aware of it and looking at it from, you know, from, from scratch, have you got any one or two words of advice as to, you know, what sort of things they need to understand about it? Uh, I, I asked the same question when I did the AIOps, you know, is it a do everything all at once right across the company or do you just choose a particular project, see how it works and then gradually roll it out? And just sort of some, some advice to folks looking at it. So, I mean, a value stream management transformation, and I do that because I don't like the word transformation very much because it's very big bang, it's very disruptive and they fail a lot. So I prefer actually to use the word evolution. So in a DevOps evolution or a DevOps journey, as a consultant, I would never try to say to everybody, do everyone um, all at once. And that's because what we're trying to do is effectively change the way that humans work. We're implementing new ways of working, whether it's agile DevOps or value stream management, it is a new approach. So what we're asking humans to do is unlearn or relearn or learn new ways of doing things. And that doesn't happen overnight. We've all got cognitive load limits. We've all got other things that we're trying to do all day. So things take time. So what will typically happen in the pattern is that there will be pockets in an organization where we get leaders that are visionaries or change agents. Um, and you'll see things moving as these people get um, more engaged with the teams around them. So um, I wouldn't do it project by project, um, partly because when we talk about value stream management, we really are making a move, and the same with Agile and DevOps, a move from project centric thinking to product centric thinking. And if you want a definition of what a value stream is, I like to define it as anything that delivers a product or a service. So the first thing we need to do is start thinking like value streams and start identifying where our value streams are in an organization. And then um, leaders can try and perhaps identify one or two value streams to start experimenting with. 
Um, metrics are key, being data driven is key. So actually getting the value stream management platforms in place quite early. Um, and you don't have to do all of the tools in the DevOps tool chain from day one. As I said, you could pick a backlog, a CI and a service desk tool um, off the bat and get quite a lot out of it without connecting everything um, that you have there. And then it's just a case of unfortunately doing the agile way of working and continuous improvement and continuous experimentation um, and working in increments as you, as you go along. Okay, well, I've enjoyed chatting to you greatly today. So Helen, thanks very much indeed for your time. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity, Phil. It's been a pleasure.